Good morning, wherever you are. Okay. So um, I want to redo the the network layer again. As I realized that I was going to pass things that I thought weren't important came up again. I just I just really want to do it again. So um, please hold on. If you've already watched the first one. You can skip some parts. I'll try as much as possible to put timestamps in the description so that you can know what is going on. But or you can just watch everything because we're talking about some parts that I didn't mention over the podcast. Thank you. So let's begin. Okay. Beautiful. So um, we're talking about the network layer. We're talking about the network layer. This is layer three and model. That's, that's one thing. And then how we are going to start with the network layer? We're going to talk about the data plane and then the control plane. What are these two plane types? Data plane talks about um you see, the network layer does two functions. So that's what is called forwarding and what is called routing. Beautiful. So um, forwarding refers to the local parameter function of moving packets from link to output link, right? So what, what does this mean? This means that um, when we pull up a map of um, Kengo ST, right? When the shuttle is moving, the shuttle can choose to pass a variety of ways, right? Whichever one the shuttle decides to pick is the winning action. It's, um, how, another analogy is that you have one intersection. Another analogy is that you have one intersection, and wedding would mean you have one intersection here. So your, your car is coming here. Right? Routing would, would determine whether you take one, take this path or this path. It is it's a local function. Right? And now routing, assume that you are an inexperienced driver, right? And then moving from a car to somewhere where we even talk about Navongo. I've heard talked about I don't even know where it is. The map that would calculate that oh, when you reach here, pass here, pass here, pass here, pass here, pass here, pick two left, pick two right, pick six, this thing, you know, that's what's called routing, right? Routing is a global action of determining the, um, the path right, that a packet will take from beginning to end. The way that you can think about this is um, what action I'm, me, me, purpose it on, so I'm allowed to take, and then what actions that are very global, right? That means that. Um, if I don't like follow this path, I won't get away from I won't, I won't get to where I'm supposed to go. You understand? Okay. Beautiful. So um routing it, routing global forwarding is very local. So I feel like that's what you can use to differentiate it to if it gets a little. Now the data plane is data plane is concerned mostly about forwarding, and then the control plane is concerned about routing. Great. So that's that's what the difference is between those two. You understand. Okay, so we're talking about data plane first, so we're talking about the control plane too. Yeah. Okay. Right. So um one question that like you would want to know is the network layer services. We've talked about TCIP. Talk about TCP, talked about UDP, we've talked about um, various and protocols and the services that they provide, you know that oh TCP um oh. okay, great. Um okay, it's like we're up for a lot of that time. Okay, yeah, so we talked about the services, right? What services does the network layer? provide and one of the things that um, I wanted to clarify is what are these services? Uh, the first service that you can get is an order delivery. That means that 
If you send your packets one, two, three, you expect them to deliver one, two, three. You don't expect them to deliver three, two, one or out of order. So you can have an in order delivery. You can have a delay guarantee. That means that you can your protocol can specify that whatever happens, you get your packets in less than a certain amount of time, maybe 14 microseconds. Something that is there. You can also get uh, um You know, get a loss guarantee. What this means is that, um, sorry, um, what this means is that you can, your protocol can specify that, um, depending on what 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 happens, regardless of what is happening in the system, no, you will get your packets lossless. Right? If you send three hundred, um, forty for the bits, uh, you get three hundred bits exactly, same whether nothing, there's no problem with it. Normally, th th this this might be specified in um. Ethernet PPP protocol, maybe. I don't really check that on that one. Maybe. Okay, good. You can also get a bandwidth guarantee. It, this means that um your service can be uh, you, you can you can decide that your protocol would have like would have a bandwidth of one gigabit per second. I mean that whatever is happening, you do, it doesn't matter. But one gigabit per second is there. You understand. You can have all these sort of guarantees. Now what does the network layer provide? Network layer provides nothing. Right? And that's the reason why so much can be built on it because it, it's, it's, it provides absolutely nothing. Right? And what happens is that your um, movement right? your um, network layer is like this. Right? It's, it's a blank slate. It just provides a minimum service so that you can build so much of it. That's why the internet has become really popular because everybody can build anything on it at any time, regardless of um, complexity, because there's nothing, there's no basis. There, there's no like, oh, um, your application must have this amount of money. So if it does not, you can know. It's a very much, it's very much a blank slate. You understand? There's nothing on it. So you can build things, a lot of things on it. You understand so the network layer provides no um in other guarantees meaning that what if you deliver your packets let's hope it gets delivered and this this particular service is called a best effort service right and akin to um there was, there was a myth a few years ago that um that they throw their babies out of their nest and then hope they they, they survive, you understand? Okay, it's, it's, it's like that. It just pushes the packets out in the world and then it hopes it gets delivered. It relies on the upper layer, um, the upper layer, uh, what do you call layers. It relies on the upper layers, yes, to um, implement some sort of guarantee. So TCP like this has flow control, congestion control. And this is possible because it is built on a, net, um, a, layer, um, a layer that that gives you nothing. To understand so flow control congestion control is possible in TCP because the network layer gives them ability to that that's why that's why it's important. So it provides no delay guarantees, provides no loss guarantees. It doesn't even provide it that then will get delivered. It doesn't provide a delivery guarantee. It's up to the, the upper layers to check that the packets are delivered. Else there will be a lot of problems. And we've already talked about how TCP does this. You understand TCP requests and um, there, there are plenty of ways of doing it. There's a sliding window it's called an uh, uh, something like that. But that's, that's what TCP does. And how, like, what, what it does is that it makes, um, it, it, it has, there are so many ways. <laughs> like, I was, I'm trying to summarize, but like, there's a sliding window. There's, um, so the ARQ, it, it's the automatic request. Automatic. automatic repeat request. Yes, automatic. The queue is what was previously automatic repeat request. And in this, um, there's like the sliding window protocol. There's the go back and there's the selective repeat. All these help TCP to um, implement delivery guarantees to make sure that your packet will be delivered. You understand? You can look at all of this and then. Talk about delivery, but the network layer there doesn't provide any guarantees. Great. So 
we've been talking about the um, data plane. Now, the data plane does one huge function, which we've talked about, which is forwarding. Um, the definition of forwarding is, is the process of moving a packet, right, from a router's input link or input port to the router's appropriate output port. What this, what this means is that there's a router. So this, this is the sign for a router. Yeah. And the router might have multiple input and output links. So which one does it go to? You understand? Which one does it go to? So this is the first problem. The second problem is that an IP address right, has 32 bits. That's a lot. Right, so um, 2 raised to the power 32 bits gives you the range of um, IP addresses. That means that your packets can go to 4.98 billion different addresses. I can go to 4.98 billion different places. So how do you determine which port it goes to? Second problem. So that's what, that's what forwarding is here to solve. And we'll talk about how forwarding solves them very soon. Okay, cool. So there's something called um, in forwarding, there are two types of forwarding. We'll come back to the next one later. The first one is called uh, let's say generalized. First one is called destination based forwarding. The second one is called generalized forwarding. We'll talk about it a little later. Generalized forwarding and destination based forwarding. So what's destination based forwarding? Destination based forwarding is basically the process of matching a packet um, destination IP address with a router's um, forwarding table to like, sort of generate um, an output link or an output port that the packet is supposed to, uh, is supposed to be sent on. So let's have a sample. Right. Normally in these tables, because they are, they are implemented at very, very low levels, you see them at bits like ones and zeros. Right? But um, for the sake of space and time, let's use the the decimal notation. Right. We'll talk about some more. Just, just, just that you didn't hear that. Great. So you have some address. Let's see. Let's make it very simple. One, two, Very simple um, wedding table. Then I talked about the router having different links. Right? So let's let's assume my router has only four links, and this is what's happening. Right? So what happens? What, what happens with um, this thing? Right? So what happens is that let's say you have an address of this. If you look at it, you see the ranges are small, so you can. You can just look at it and see that it's supposed to go in link one. Right? But the thing about it is that the, the, the forwarding tables are very large because they have to accommodate 4.98 billion addresses. Right? So this, 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 this is not really that um, efficient, you understand. You look through the sort of like try to match it. So then um, something came up called longest prefix matching. Longest prefix matching, um, in longest prefix matching, what happens is that then there's there's no really an address range like this. Let's let you let's draw something to that effect. From digital systems, you remember that this means don't care, right? That means we don't really care what's going on. So we only care about the first eight bits. And let's say that we only care about this and everything else is a don't care. And we only care about this. Okay, let's make it one zero. And we only care about this one, two, three. So what the what destination for it matching? The, the rule is that for any 32 bit IP address to match a particular prefix, right? All the like the most significant bits of that address must match the ones and zeros in that prefix, right? 
And in the case that you have two or more that fit into um, like that, that can match the prefix. No, you pick the longest one to understand. So let's say we have an address range. We have, we have an address which is one one zero zero one zero zero zero. Right. In this one, uh, you try to match it. It matches. It matches this. Matches this. It matches this one. It matches the first one more. You understand. But it doesn't match it to to the end. Meaning that it will go to output length three. That was a bad example. Something else. You see that address is like this, right? It matches both two and one, but one is longer, so it will be taking two outputs like one, right? And um, let's say you have something one zero one zero one zero one zero dot dot dot. The dot means that like it exists, but we didn't include it. But so we'll be taking two outputs like three because it matches it, and there's no longer prefix. So that's how prefix matching works, right? Number one. Look at which one it matches. So doesn't match all four. Great. Then you which one doesn't match the longest. So with this one, it match two. By match two with only three, three um, prefixes, right? and it match this one with eight prefixes. So obviously the longest, that's why it's called longest prefix matching. It matches the one, and then it actually sends it. This is the link. It sends it to the link with the longest prefix. You understand? So like I, I, I hope that makes sense. And the, the beauty about this is that if, if you looked at a little um, computational complexity, right, and you come across the big one notations, right, what happens is that the beauty about this is that it can be implemented to have a constant time. And I feel like that, that's, that's very good, meaning that you don't have to spend a lot of time. So we talked about the delays, like delays there. And we talked about the, the node processing delay. We talked about the queuing delay. We talked about the transmission and propagation delay. And we talked about what the nodal. I'm trying to give you a recap, <laughs> but the no doubt processing delay was about you need to check the headers, check checksums, error checking, error detection, error um, correction, those things, right? So um, what happens is that uh, it can get you the address, no matter how long the cable is, right? it can get you the address in a constant amount of time. And that's, that's, that's beautiful, meaning that you don't really have to worry about like um, um, cable lookup taking too much time. Okay. And, and that's, that's important in our, we want everything fast. Well, okay, great. Um, okay, let's let's talk about that. But if you are curious, uh, basically, um, um, the longest prefix matching is performed using what is called the ternary content addressable memories. You know, as I said, uh, just a mistake. Oh, let's move on to IPv4 and addressing. We're talking about how forwarding destination based forwarding works right, with both the table. So questions can come like that. I feel like questions will also come. From that place, so be very doing your tools on that side. To look at how um, how to do matching in both situations, right? Where the address is a range and where the address is longest prefix matching. I hope you'll be able to. Do that. We'll look at some questions. Great, yeah. So that what what is the IP protocol? We've heard of it uh, that it is the only protocol in the when you look at the stack. The only protocol you see there. The application layer can have so many protocols. It can have HTTP. Like, like, that's why you have to memorize those ports now. It can have SSH, it can have uh, the SNTP. SNTP, right? It can, have, it can have the SNMP, it can have dash, it can have, it can have plenty. The transport layer can have the TCP and then the UDP. You understand? The um, link layer can have Ethernet. We're talking about it very, very soon. It can have Ethernet, it can have PPP, it can have um, the Wi Fi um, protocol, which is IEE, IEE, -E, yes, I -E, 802.11, um, whatever. Those who did networking, hmm, yeah, yes, um, yeah, it can have that, right? And then uh, the physical, too, can have a lot of uh, protocols to talk about it, right? But then the um, network layer only has one protocol, the IP protocol. So what's IP protocol? The IP protocol is, is, is a set of rules, right? A protocol is basically a set of rules, a set of regulations or standards, right? That is concerned about it. Like it's concerned about three things, right? The datagram's format. What is the format of this datagram? Like, can, can, can I draw a, can you draw a format for me? Right? The, IP, the IP protocol defines the format of um, an IP datagram. We we'll talked about the format of um, TCP. Then the UDP datagram, so and UDP segments. 
So we'll talk about what the IP um, and data gram also looks like. And then we'll talk about how addresses are structured and integrated. A few years ago, there was this TIB about um, Facebook stealing your data with, um, they could look at your IP address, where there was this thing where a lot of people were looking at VPNs and things. We will be looking at, if, if we have time, which I doubt everybody will skip, so I'll, maybe I'll send it to the last part. So if you're interested, you can just watch about what, what, what more was going on. Okay, cool. So how are these addresses structured and implemented? And, and how are they, how can they be used to track people? You've heard those things, right? So if you know my IP address, what's going to be like? What can you really do, right? So look at all that. And if you're interested, I will spend some three, three, two minutes with looking at it in an actual um, terminal and seeing what's up, what, what, what is going on. Right? And it also talks about packet handling conventions. So these are the three things that IP, um, the IP protocol is concerned about, packet handling conventions. So how is the packet supposed to be handled in great? So one important thing, one important thing, one important thing is that as part of the IP protocol, there's something called INCMP, Internet Control Message Protocol, right? It's not really a different protocol. So it's, it's not really a different protocol. It's just implemented like as part of IP. So you have, you remember the way that you have different versions of apps that you like, right? So you can have version 1.0, version 2.0. So in a certain version yeah, of the IP protocol, ICMP was just added to help them with um, error repeating and then error signaling, right? We'll cover this when we talk about the control plane. Oh, so packet handling convention is built. So the first thing we need to look at is um, the IP datagrams format, right? And then we'll look at how IP addresses are formatted. Plus I'm writing it then. So this is IPv4. Let me know even, this is IPv4, IP version 4. <laughs> A question that last time, as I was, I was, I was thinking about it, it came up was like, what's the difference between IPv4? Like, why is it IP4? Like, what, where, what happened to one, two, and three? And then what is IPv6? What happened to version five? But we'll talk, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it when we get to that. Okay. Okay. So this, this is how it is. So the first one is called the version field. So this version will hold either four or six, you understand, depending on what you want to do. Though maybe you did, the company has implemented some beautiful sort of um, IP protocol, and then you look at it and then say that, oh, IP protocol is version 19, you place your version here. This is the header length, you understand. You see, an IP datagram can contain a variable number of options. So here, options is here, right? Options, if any. So it means that you can include options your um, IPv4, like as part of a header, you can include some options that are not changed now. You should you should bring it. Maybe you have some special things that you want to place here. Right? So that means that you can have a variable length from here uh, to here is twenty bytes. So we usually say that an IP um, datagrams header is twenty bytes plus options overhead. This is how you usually talk about. So if you have zero options, your options overhead is zero. If you have 10 bytes of options, your options overhead is 10. So that's what happens. So your header length will talk about the entire length of your, your header, including options, so that you can know where to start handling the packet from. You understand? You can, you can get to it. This is the type of service field. Right? The type of service field allows um, datagrams to be distinguished from each other. Right? So Last last time when we talked about the, the TCP, we talked about the ECN, right? And um, explicit congestion notification, right? So um okay, let's talk about it. Let's talk about type of service. Type of service, it has um it has is it seven? No, it has eight, it's eight bits, right? I mean that it's a, it's a one byte thing, right? Now from the zeroth byte, because you're talking in computer terms, from zero to five, it's talked about the class. Right. And this is called diff serve. So what, what this means is that the different types of data, right? Data you can have, the different classes of data that you can have. So if, if you want to differentiate your data, it's not just normal. Maybe yours has a certain priority level that it needs to get. In certain organizations, and 
someone has priority more than you, you understand? So that person, if, if the, 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 the network is bottlenecked, right? There are different um, um, services that you should provide to different packets, you understand? So if your service is like, let's say somebody is downloading some 20 gigabytes movie and the CEO's message goes across border, the CEO's message shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't go and lag behind someone's 20 gigabytes movie, you understand? It should have a different, a different priority to everybody's own. So, so this talks about the class of traffic. So they can be giving different service. That's why it's called this uh, very intuitive, I know. And then this is the ECN, right? Specific congestion notification. These are two bits that determine whether um, a router is, is, is choked or not. And this allows for um, control, you understand, for congestion control in various means and ways. So that's type of service, you understand? And this is the length of the entire packet. So this 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 packet indicates the total number of bytes in your datagram. You understand? So this is the header plus options plus payload. This is payload. You understand? This includes everything. Great. And this the next the next line we talk about this is 16 bit identifier. We really talk about this, right? It doesn't really matter. We won't talk about it. Right? These are flags. This particular line, we won't really talk about it, but this particular line. This is fragment offset. This particular line is basically for fragmentation and reassembly. That means that if a packet is too large and it is sliced into by your your um data link protocol, right? Um, what will happen? You understand? That's what your your fragmentation offset does for you. Great. And then this is your TTL field. Let's talk about this some. TTL means time to learn. Right. Now, what happens is that. Uh, um, a packet can move, let's say that, let, let's say that a router suddenly goes offline, you understand? And then there's a router, a, a, a server suddenly goes offline, but the server has, okay, I, I really hope you understand this. A server has, let's say, a load balancer, so it can send, it can be sent to two of, two ways, right? It can be sent to um, server one and then server two, right? What happens is that, um, um, a packet can move through the system, so let's say both of these go offline. Right? You say your, your packet can move through the system, so if these two are located at two different places, right? what happens is that you try to locate server one and you can't locate it. But because server two, which is handled by the same load balance, sort of has in quotes the same um, IP you node, know, and you try to get to server two, and then if server two is offline, try to get to server one, and then it shenanigans all across board. And so what happens is that your packet can move through the network forever like without ever reaching the destination because like your packets are like your servers are off so you can't do anything about it and it's giving because these two are two different places giving the illusion of one one must be on at one time you understand so your packet can move to the system all at once like can move sa and if um because your packet is not dead right it's still moving to the network that means it's consuming network resources but but your the host doesn't know that the packet is still alive, so it will try to send another packet after it, and now it will be moving. So, so this can really consume a lot of network resources. So um, the IPv4 format has what is called the time to live um, a TTL field, and this is a counter that is decremented by one for every time a datagram passes through a router. I mean, if it passes through this router, it reduces by one. If it goes to another router, it's reducing by one. Now, when the node processing delay is going on, eh, whenever there are, eh, the router notices that the TTL field is zero, it will just extinguish that packet, it will kill that packet forever, so that the hosts, like right now, like it, it sort of helps to understand. It, it just it just sort of helps. I hope you you go on there. Basically, it's a counter that is documented by one every single time that um, the IP datagram passes to a router. Great. And this is upper layer. So this, this upper layer just indicates the type of upper layer protocol that you are dealing with. So you should, um, there are two types of upper layer protocols, TCP and then UDP, right? So which should it be delivered to? Maybe your packet is a, a, a UDP a packet. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be sent to TCP because TCP's handling will be different. If you remember, if you remember the, the format of TCP, TCP would format and then would, um, it will read your packet differently than 
how you need to work if you understand it. And this is the, the header checksum. We're already talking about the checksum already. This is source IP address. This is the destination IP address. All of them are 32 bits. You understand? And this is the payload data. The payload data too might be different. It, it might have a variable um, size. That's why this, this length is useful. Payload is, is TCP or UDP segment. You understand? And it's, it's a variable length because if you remember TCP, TCP's payload is um, application data. And the application data might have 12 bits or 26 billion bytes. You understand? You don't know what it actually might be. So this entire thing has variable. And that's one of the things that um, IPv6 would cure. You understand? There's plenty of things. There's nonsense. So we looked at the IP data RAM format and then we looked at what it is. Now, one important side note, we'll be keeping side notes here so that you can keep track. These are just facts that I didn't know where to put them in the explanation. But the maximum that um, 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 an IP datagram can be, because it's a variable length, but the maximum it can be is 64 kilobytes. Yeah, 64 kilobytes. And then, but usually, right, the average length is something around 155, 1,500 bytes, you understand? And so 1.5. Um, kilobytes in essence. Okay, yeah, cool. So let's move on. IP addressing. Talk about IPv4 and IP addressing. I wanted to um open this without any well, IP addressing usually you don't get to see the actual thing in action so give me like two minutes to this is basically now let's let's look at this right we'll talk we'll talk we'll talk about private and then let's look at an actual ip address I me mean that my laptop is has an IP address of 10 for one seven. This lease, when we talk about um DHCPR, we'll look at what leases and um expiry dates are. You understand? Because you can't take an IP address forever. Usually it's it's 3660 minutes, right? So that means it's let's three six six three six zero zero seconds. So it's an hour, usually it's an hour. You understand? I'll try and then I'll try, I'll connect my phone to, like, all right, I'm using a can USB Wi-Fi. Right? I'll connect my phone to it, and then we'll also see what you can see. I'll connect my phone to it, so, what is it? Ah, yeah, so, you have to be for address, right? I'll connect my phone to it to see, so that I can actually see the difference. So when you're talking about private and then public IP addresses, so that will seem much clearer. Right? So, you have your DNS service sitting here to, to understand. Yeah. So you've seen the IP address, and th th this this private IP address that doesn't mean anything right now because I'm trying to make it systematic. But as we go, you see so IP address, and you've also seen a subnet mask. Right? This is beautiful, so that you see what is going on. Two five five point two two five five dot two four eight dot zero. We'll see what all of this means as time goes on. Beautiful. So let's go, let's go and then let's go and look at um when I connect my phone to. So right now this is Eduram. What, what do I do when I connect my phone to it? Great. So we have fun. So at the moment, uh, my phone is connected to it. Let's, let's look at it. It has changed. This is, I'm using a mobile access system right now i'm not using a pirate so this is a public this this is also sort of private but more well let's just assume this is this this is you see the difference between those two depending on the network i connect to my ipad my subnet mask has also changed into different networks i'm setting hpc dh cp server setting somewhere and then my dns service also setting great Right, so yes, that's that's it. So let's look at. 
things while I give up to normal. So you've seen how it exists, like how your IP address can exist, and then what a public and private is, and it's really like subnet mask, and the fact that DNS service and DHCP service can be sitting on your network. Beautiful. Okay, let's get to it, right? So what's an IP address, right? Um, what happens is that we just talked about um, the IP address. Right? No, the IP address really doesn't identify this laptop, right? It identifies, it basically identifies the interface that you are connected to. You just saw that this is a wireless LAN adapter Wi-Fi. So he's talking about the, the, the network that my Wi-Fi is connected to, right? Internet Bluetooth also has a description, right? The Ethernet adapter too also has it has an address. If I'm if, if I'm to connect something to my Ethernet right now, you see like something that's connected to the Ethernet, maybe a router or something, you see that my oh this close. You see that um, my internet also has um, an IP address. You understand? That means that it identifies an interface, not a host or a router or anything like that. You understand? Good. A router usually has multiple interfaces, so a router would have and multiple IP addresses, right? That does, that does, does it. Understand? Now, there are two types of representing IP addresses, the dotted decimal notation. We've already talked about this. It looks like numbers like 223.1.1.0. That's how the, that's how we look because human brains cannot understand the 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 thing so easily, right? And then you also have the um, binary notation where it is 010010.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0
but we need to really understand. So what's subnet addressing? Right. So an important another little bit right, that I didn't know where to put. What's a subnet mask? A subnet mask is um is is, is a, a certain number of bits, right? So it is um it is the wait, how do I put it? It is how many high order bits that a subnet has in common. You understand. So let's say that um okay, these are numbers, but basically um for as I said, for two devices to belong to a subnet and the subnet portion must be the same and that host portion must be different. So for a subnet portion to be the same, that means that it must have some bits in common. So the number of bits in common is your subnet mask. You understand. So let's say they have 12 bits in common, subnet mask. It has 16 bits in common, subnet mask. It has 24 bits in common, subnet mask. So let's look at another example. Great. So Normally, this 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 is your this is your subnet, right? So we come to the number of um hundred will have any four, and then you have twenty four. So twenty four is your subnet mask. You understand the number of high order bits that they have in common. And if they were twelve, bar, subnet mask could be twelve. And this 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 part is your host part. That's why it's don't care. Meaning that if you want host one, you just change it to one zero 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 one. Great. So in this this in binary will give you two 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 three dot one dot one dot x slash twenty four, and this we talk about the slash rotation. Okay, I, I hope that plenty back and forth is, is making sense. I talked about IP addressing, I talked about the subnet, I'm talking about how subnet addressing is called. Right? Now this slash notation is called CIDR, right? classless interdomain routing. We'll come to it. We'll come to it. We'll come to it in a few moments, right? So let's ignore all of this and then let's talk about DHCP. DHCP. Right? We saw the DHCP server setting some more. So what does it actually do? DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Config Protocol. So from the name, what can you guess? Dynamic Host configuration protocol. So this is the protocol that configures dynamic hosts as some. So you see, what, what do you mean by dynamic hosts, right? There's some hosts that are not connected. So if you check for Google right now, right? Let, let's do that right now. Let's do that. I want to inject some fun to this thing also to become very... Um, let's get some fun into it. Then we saw Google. So this address, right? What happens? Let's ignore that one, right? But there's something called a DNS cache. Like what I'm doing right now is not really checking. It's not really sending it out, right? It's just checking it has. So basically, it's it's like what Google's address. Google's address can change. It's it's sort of fixed because it's a website that you need to access most of the time. If you remember what we talked about, client server, the the, the server really doesn't have a um, it doesn't have a dynamic address. It's usually just one, so they can usually easily find it. You understand? And this is the address of the DNS server that KNST. What I'm using right now because I'm still I'm connected chain back I'm connected to KNST Wi-Fi. Great. So what does this mean in the general one? This means that service can't have um uh, service can change their DNS and um, they can change the IP addresses. But things like phones, laptops, I just changed my, my my network. So things like that can change their uh, networks. And because they can change their networks, they can change their IP addresses. Because IP addresses don't they don't identify a system, they identify the network. You understand? I hope this is all making sense. Great. 
So the dynamic host configuration protocol is the, is the protocol that will configure any host that joins. You can join and you can leave. And because you can join and you can leave, no. IP addresses need to be dynamic. I mean, they need to be, they, they, they need to be such that, like when it gives it out, it can give it to another person. And that's what yeah, the JCP or does. Great. Right. Um, oh, so um, in order to, okay, before that, then, uh, what happens is that then um, HCP creates what is called a plug and play IP address. This means that you just need to contact whenever you join to a network. I don't know. And there's sometimes that can you see Wi Fi wasn't working when you try to join a network, it will tell you IP configuration failure. Yeah, what, what, what that means is that then uh, you are trying to connect to the network, and when you connect to the network, you need an IP address. Because to send packets and to receive packets, you need an IP address, right? So that they can know where the packet is coming from and where to send it to. And then um, like your, your network can also know how to route packets to you. So you need an IP address. So if, if you can't get an IP address, I'm meaning that the network that you've joined is nonsense. Like they, they can't do, you can't literally do anything. Whenever you send packets, uh, the router will think it's a joke and then we'll drop it. You understand? Yeah. So um, we'll come to look at the JCP overview. Right. So, We'll make it very simple. There are just four steps, right? Number one is called the DHCP discover message. Right? When we talk about IP addresses somewhere, you get to know what is called broadcast address, right? A broadcast address is an address that ends in 255. We don't care what happens in the beginning, but it ends in 255. This is called limited broadcast, right? When all is 255, it is called a broadcast. But, but when it ends in 255, it's called a broadcast. That means that when you send out, if, you, if your phone or laptop sends out a message with the dot two five five, what it means is that it will send it to all the hosts on that network. It will send it to all the, the hosts that are connected to your network. You understand? That's what the broadcast message is called. So usually your DHCP server set on your network is inside your, your, your network somehow. So when you send the discover message, the DHCP server will get it, right? Discover message is basically saying that, Charlie, I just joined the network and I'm looking for an an IP address. If um like you know where the DHCP server is at, like if you're the DHCP server, let me know. So you're just looking for a DHCP server. You understand? So it sends a message with a two five five like as the location. That's how it gets it. When your router sees two five five, it will send them that message to everybody. And when your laptop that is also connected to the network gets um a message looking for an IP address because it can't, it is not working with any DHCP software. No, so just drop it. You understand? So only DHCP server would respond. Great. Number two is a DHCP offer. So what happened is that the DHCP server would reply with its um, um, IP address. It will, reply, it will reply with its IP address, and the destination will also be a broadcast. Because there about that, it doesn't know who is um, looking for the who is looking for the IP address. So to send the offer to everybody, and if 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 you've not received um, an IP address, you can just just if you if you already have an IP address, you can discard it. But as you don't have an IP address, actually, you will reply to it with what is called a DHCP request message. So this DHCP this DHCP request message is basically um telling the system that oh I received this IP address or I have this IP address that I want to join. Please put it down that me i'm using this ip address great so the dhcp request is basically saying that oh i have this ip address that i just got right and i want to use this ip address so um what's up can can you please put it down that I'm the one who is using this IP address and no one else, so that everything will be routed to me, so that I can use this IP address. And then finally, the DHCP server would send back what is called a JCP act. That's basically saying, oh yeah, you can use the IP address, and then to tell you how long you have to use it. That's called a lifetime. Wait, now these two are optional, right? And they're optional because the DHCP request can be from somebody. So let's say that I joined the network and then I got open and I joined again. Right? I have an IP address that I was using. I could just tell the network that, oh, yeah, Charlie, I have this address and I want to use it. Like, is it possible? And the JSP server would send me an ARC and say, yeah, yeah, you can use it. Or if I've never joined that network before, I would have to start from the discover. But a request can be from an IP address that somebody told me I could use 
and maybe from P2P architecture, somebody can tell you that, oh, you can use this IP address or an IP address from a previous address or an IP address from the DCP offer. You understand? So th th those are ways that you can get. So these two are mandatory and these two are optional. Great. Beautiful. Great. Now, um, the DCP server returns more than just your address because you, with, with an address, you can't still do anything. With, like, think about it. Like, what can you exactly do with just an IP address? You need the address of a router that you can contact. So it will send you there also the address of the first hop router. Hop router is like a router from um, a router that is like close to you. You understand? In actuality, it is a router that's like that can access your network. So yes, it will send the address of the first hop router. So that if you are sending packets, you need to you know where to send them. First hop router's IP address. It will send you the name and address of the DNS server. We already talked about DNS server. The DNS server is basically a table. In this, in this course, in the plain table, it's basically a table of IP addresses and names. So if you type google.com, you can't actually google.com your way. So you have to find the IP address because IP address is like, IP address is what helps you locate where you're going to, help you locate the server. So just giving a name, you can't find anything. So you have to find the IP address of that name that corresponds to that name. So you find the name and address of the DNS server. And then you also find a network mask. Right. So this, 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 this is the slash 24 slash 12 thing we're talking about. You understand? Yeah. And all of these can be configured manually, but the DHCP server message also has fields that can send them to you. You understand? We are talking about the um, address resolution protocol. We'll talk more about what, what this means. Great. Okay. So a few more things that I didn't know where to put them. I can and I E T F. Is it F or B? Inter Internet for creation for assign names and numbers. You understand? This, this is what will give um the ISPs that IP address block. Like so these, these people are at the top. I can at the top. Right. And then they give IP addresses to what are called regional registries. Assume like these are sort of like country sort of. So these these people can use this people and these regional registries loan them out to and what are called local registries. So assume that a good way to think about the icon is at the very top and then it it gives countries IP address ranges that you can use and then these these countries will loan loan them out to ISPs. So MTN has this certain amount. This certain amount, this certain amount, you understand. And this is how you also get an IP address. You understand because MTN, when you connect to MTN, the MTN's DHCP server will also give you an IP address to use. I, I hope this makes sense. Yeah. So this is how you will get an IP address. Very simple. Yeah. And um okay. this, this is a fact, it's not really necessary. Yeah, beautiful. We're getting to the end. Ash. Now I'm about to start with something fresh, right? IP addresses. Uh, I didn't notice I've been saying something wrong. It's not 4.98, no, it is 4.29. It's 4.29 billion addresses. 2.32 will give you 4.29 billion addresses. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. We talked about IP addresses, we talked about it. So you let's move on to classful addressing. Wow. I'm just noticing it very plain to you. <laughs> Please forgive me. I've done this thing a long time ago. Okay, so we have five classes of IP addresses. Class A, B, C, D, E. So I think there's a question here that we use to solve it. Okay, sorry for the interruption once again. Great. So, where is the question? Number 18 and 19, right? Giving these two addresses, find their classes. Great. So, let's talk about class one. Okay. The five classes of IPv4 addresses, class E to class E. So, how do we differentiate this? And we differentiate this with octet. An octet refers to eight bits. 
Okay, so yes, yes. Right. Now this is going to be a little strange, but just 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 bear with me, right? Um zero x x x zero x x one zero x x x x x x one one zero x x x one 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 zero x x yes one 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 x x x x if your first octet starts with zero right it's it's, it's a class a address if it starts with one zero class b one 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 I, I hope you get it so for any address that you are giving you have to convert it to um you have to convert it to binary and then look at what it is if the first four are uh one zero uh, one zero and you don't care what is next uh, it's a class b address to understand and this also has some connotations yet okay so um basically these have ranges right these have ranges that means that all class a addresses must start with zero. All class B addresses must start with one zero. You understand? So what does this mean? This means that the first class A address is zero 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 zero, zero two zero one 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 one. You understand? The second, the first class B address, like that, can be is one zero 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 two one zero one 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 one. And this is how we find the ranges for all the classes. You understand this continues for all the remaining classes too so for class e it says one 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 zero 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 to one 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 this for class e i'll leave the rest to you as homework you understand so let's just take an example let's take an example let's find the class of one nine two before we get to that question one nine two dot one six eight dot one point zero what is one nine two let's get the calculator out Okay, so one nine two gives you a binary of one one zero 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 to so one one zero zero one two three four. One six eight gives you one zero one zero one one zero one zero one zero 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 and one obviously gives you zero 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 one. And ten gives you I feel like this thing I should know it too. Ten gives you um zero 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 one zero one zero. Okay. Okay, so this, this is what it gives you to understand. Now we have to compare it to the first one. It starts with one one zero, one one zero, so one one zero, and if it's class C. So this is a class C address. I hope this makes sense to you. This is literally the first address in class here. I don't know whether you can see it. Let's take another example. I feel like with this one more examples, the better. And one, one important thing I didn't also add was that um the class D addresses are called multicast addresses. We'll get to the types when we talk about private and um, but just know that like D and um, class D addresses are called multicast addresses, and class E are called experimental or research. Post addresses. If I can use either of the two, great. Yes, so let's take another example. Um, 230.10.65.30. So, um, 230. 230 gives us 111. Zero zero one one zero. We only need the first one. Like honestly, I just wanted to show you the conversion, but we we'll just really need the first one. And the first one conforms more to class D at one 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 zero. 
right? If I'm coming to multi class D, so we say this is a class D or multi cast address. Let's now let's go to the past questions. One nine two. One nine one dot one nine two dot one seven two dot seventy. This is it. So what is one nine two? One nine two. So to make it simple, we won't write anything. We'll just look at it. One nine two is one one zero. And what does like one one zero conform to? Keep in mind that it was zero x x x. It was one zero x x. It was one one zero x. It was one 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 zero and one 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 one. That gives you your addresses. So, what does one one zero, like one one zero 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 conform to? Hey, this one nine one. So what does one nine one conform more to? Like to see that one nine one conforms to class B, right? One zero conforms more to class B. So this is a class B address, and this is one nine two dot one nine one. And because we don't care about it, what is one nine two? One nine two it conforms to one one zero, right? You see, conforms more to class C, but this is a class C address. I'm coming to put up some other ones on the on the screen so that you can try your hands on it to understand. One dot ten dot two hundred dot six, and then one seven two dot one five dot one six one point one. Please pause it here if you don't want the answer. Pause it here so that you can try it on, on your own. So I'm, coming to, I'm coming to write the answer in three seconds. One, two, three. So please pause it. I hope you would have paused it if you don't want the answer. So yes, so this is class E and this is class B. Please try it out. Eh? Please try it out. It's, it's useful for you to get a hang of it. But we've solved these two questions. The first one was B and the second one was C. What E and C? Okay. So yes. So we're talking about the subnet mass as the the um, the number of the most number of bits. What happens is that for every class, there's something called the default subnet mask. So let's write the table here. So class default mask. But A B C D E. So this this just has a default mask of let's you let's do start notation so that you can see. Yeah. This has a this and because the, these are both multicast, we'll, we'll leave these ones for now. We'll come and talk about why uh, these are there. Oh, yeah, good. So let's talk about um what we need to talk about. I don't think there's anything else to talk about, though. We'll solve some questions. We'll get to what we can actually talk about. I've talked about the slash notation. That, that's really important. Yes. Um, hmm. So the, sub, the, subnet, um, um, the subnet tells you which um, devices are in the same network. So if you get something like 10.10.10.6, 10 right? And then this is a class E network. This is a class E network, meaning that for, for a class E network, eh, or if if the device if the devices are in the same network, are, the first one needs to be the same okay? for class C, for class B, both of them need to be same. Class C or class D. You understand? So for I, I hope I hope what I just said makes sense. So right? the first octet must be the same for um devices in the same class A network. So for class A, ten point ten point ten point ten and ten point twenty point twenty point twenty are the same network for class A. For class B, this, these are just examples, 10 point, 10 point. Like this needs to be the same for class E. So you can get a question like, which of the following are in the same uh, class B network? And you can get multiple examples. There's actually a question like that. 
<laughs> I don't know why I mean I didn't think of it. Yet. The question like that is one. Even a certain subnet uh, belong to the same like belong to the same subnet. Yeah, that's what they're asking. Something like this. I, I hope you see what the problem is. Great. Let's let's look at the question and let's use this. So eighty point eighty point eighty slash eighty point eighty. Wait, I think of our classless um, addressing a. So we can't solve that question just yet. We can't solve that question just yet. Okay. Okay. Um, so... Let's take an example. Let's take an example for class four. Okay. There's a certain host in a class C network. There's a certain host in a class C network who has an IP address of 192.168.17.9. This host in a class C network has this address. We're supposed to find the number of addresses in the block. The first address and last address. Great. So how do we do this? Right. So step one, what is the default subnet mask? We've been given the class, right? We've been given the class as a class C network. So if you remember the default subnet is a class C slash 24 and it is um 255.255.255.0. I wish I had feedback so that I could know how well I'm I'm, I'm doing. If I still confuse it, they just, just comment and then we'll see how we we'll solve it. Okay. The class C network, this is just the bottom net mask. Right. And knowing this, uh, right, see for class C network, only the, the last octet changes. So the network portion is 192.168.17. The, the, the reason being that when, when we talked about subnet, we talked about the network and then the host portion, right? that the, the subnet portion is the same for every subnet, meaning that given like a, a subnet, uh, which is class C, giving a mask as 24, that means the first 24 bits must never change. You understand? And the first 24 bits correspond to 192 to 168 to 17. This makes sense. This makes sense. The last bit is your host number. Yeah. So host portion is dot nine. Yeah. Okay, so knowing this, uh, right, see, you have eight, uh, so you take the host portion and then you check how many bits you have. Bits in host of um, host portion would equal eight, you understand? So, and if you want to find the number of um, permutations of eight, right, so just eight raised to two raised to the power eight, which is two, five, six. Now, the problem with this is that there are two addresses for every single subnet network. There are two addresses you must never use. We talked about the reason why. Well, that one is network address, right? When you see 192.168.17.9.0, it's a network address, right? This is what your network, this is what you're like, your network is broadcasting to other people. So you, it doesn't belong to a host. It sort of belongs to um, a particular router, you understand? And 192.168.17.255 is your broadcast address. If you want to send, so we talked about the THCP server thing, right? If you join the network and you want to send a message to everybody in the network, you end with two five dot two five five. So this is a limited broadcast address. You understand? So I hope this makes sense to you. Okay. So you can't use these two. So you have to subtract two from it, giving the number of usable addresses ending up at two five four. You understand? And the first address is obviously your network address, which is this. And your last address is this. Yeah. This makes sense. This this all happens because. Class C. If you give me a slasher, if you give me a slasher, what I'll do is to convert everything to binary. When I convert everything to binary, then I know my network portion and I know my host portion. Now, when I get to know the two, then I'll find the number of addresses in my host portion, and then take two from it to get the number of usable addresses. So the number of total addresses I can use is 256. The number of usable addresses I can use is 254. My first one will be host. My first one will be network, and my second one will be host. I hope this. 
and make sense to you. So this is it. So now we can look at the question. We're still not talking about class lists. Okay, so let's look at class list addressing. Try that. Ah, no. I promise we'll do this. We'll talk about this. Public and private IP addresses. Basically, when, when we continue more and we talk about IPv6, we'll talk about something called NAT, Network Address Translation. Right? That is where a router broadcasts sort of a static IP address. Right. It broadcasts like one IP address for everybody inside the network. You understand? So we'll talk about it when we get to it. It's sort of a more in-depth explanation. Right. Now, private IP addresses are IP addresses of a certain like type, right? They are they are three. 10.10. Wait, sorry, that's a 10.0.0.0 10 10 slash eight. And then 172.16.0.0 slash twelve and then one nine two point one six eight dot zero dot zero so if you see any address of this type then they are private IP addresses then like the, if, if anybody were to send a message to this online uh, it, it there's nothing that would it, it won't be able to send any message because this doesn't belong to one device out there it belongs to for every single network that you have there this is how the router sends everybody the router just uses 10.0.0.0 like 0 to 10.255.255.255. Right? So it uses all of this. Right? So you can have multiple. Right? So you can use this. So this is what the router would see everybody as. And the world will also see you as something different. We get to network address translation. You understand? And then we we'll explain IP, public and private to someone. So because of plenty reasons, which we won't get into because the time is getting somewhere. Classful addressing became very unuseful. Classless addressing was picked up. Right? So in classless and um, classless classes is also called CIDA. Remember, classless interdomain routing. Right? This is classless addressing. Right. And in this, what is happening is that you can have any subnet mask you want. That's that's basically the basis of it. Basically, you can have any subnet mask that you want. Um, you don't have to conform to only slash 8, slash 16, or slash 24. You can have any like um, um, subnet mask that you want to understand. And one important thing is that how do you identify a valid subnet mask? A valid subnet mask is basically consecutive ones. That's basically it. If you see, um, if you, when we talk about the, the class for learning, we talked about um, 0xxx talking about 10xxx talking about 10x 11110 and 111 basically you can identify a valid subnet masks by just ones and zeros you understand if you have some one and it's followed by anything else it ends there you understand okay cool hey did that make sense Talked about subnets, talk about subnet masks, but we're not talking about subnetting. Subnetting is basically the process of subnetting, is it basically the process of um, creating subnets from a network, right? And in clusters, we just don't, we can't restrict, like, we can restrict, like, we don't have any restriction to what we can, like, what the subnet mask is, right? So now let's look at an example, right? Um, we can solve this particular question now. We have 80 point, 80 point, 80 point, 80 slash Again, slash 27. So what, what it's basically saying is that um, the network part 
on the subnetwork part is the first 27 bits. This is 8, this is 16, this is 24, right? 26, 25, 26, 27. So from here down here is your, your subnet. That means that this can change, but everything else can change. And what is the question they're asking us? Is for each question, choose the group that does not contain any valid address for the given subnet. So basically what they're asking is that which one of the following, like, like look to and then pick um ah. okay. So they're telling you that pick the group that contains invalid IP addresses for this subnet. So what is the beginning and what's the end of this subnet? So that like you can determine it, right? Cool. So this is 80.80.80. .80. Now this, this is going to change. And then ending is also so this to this. Right. Now, what we can do is we can change everything to zero, and then we can change everything to one, and that will give us our like our range. If you change everything to zero, you get zero, one, zero, one, two, three, four, five. And if you change everything to one, you get zero, one, zero, one, 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 one. So we can check what that value is. Yeah, so this is it. And this gives us a decimal of 64. So it's not 64. Two. So this is it, and this gives us 95. So these are the valid IP addresses that you can get from this subnet. So let's check which one doesn't fit into this. So we had. That's 64 to 96. So if you see a group of IP addresses that don't fit, 64 to 96. 32 is obviously not part. 32 doesn't, 32 is less than 64. Yeah, sorry, I quickly went to something. Okay, cool. So, yes, we had 64 to 96. So, <laughs> I want to check what the meaning of the question was because it was confusing. Ah, that this is a very complex sentence. Um, so, yes, so what the question is asking is basically that which of the groups, right? Like when you look at, you see, there are four. So, which of the groups contains invalid IP addresses for all the four, right? So, if you look at it, then Step 32 is not part, so like 32, 32 here, yeah, so elimination. So yes, it's C, the answer is C, because 64 to 96, and we talked about what it is, right? Giving a particular subnet, then, giving a particular subnet, the first address is your network address, and your last address is your broadcast address. And that's what these are doing. That means that 80 point, 80.80.64, 80 80.80.95 are invalid addresses. Like you can't use them, right? Well, like you can't use it to point to a particular host to understand. You can't. So that's, that's an invalid IP address. So we have um, 60.95 here, and we have 96 and 32. So it's a C, that's nice. Because um, 65 is valid. You want to know 65 is valid here, 65 is so valid, and 65 is 65 is also valid. So it's a C. C contains invalid for all of them. You understand? So it's a C. Let's move on to um, the next one. The next one to follow the same pattern, right? You identify the network part, then you 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 find the, the first address and the last address by filling the host with 
zeros and then the, the host with ones. You understand? So let's look at it again. 90.90.90.90 slash 28. Okay, so 90 is what? 0101 0101 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 or subnet part, and this is your host part. So, um, 90 remains the same, 90 remains the same, 90 remains the same, and the first one is 0101000, and this one, the last one is 0101111. Yeah, I hope the process is making like it's making sense to you. Zero one one and that is ninety five. Hey, wait, ninety five. This is ninety five, rather. Eighty, right? So eighty to ninety-five, and eighty is your network, and then this is broadcast. So um, let's look for one that doesn't fit inside. Seventy-five, seventy-nine, obviously not fit. Ninety-six, obviously not fit. So seventy-nine, seventy-nine, eighty, ninety-five, ninety-six. Another C again. Hey, that's weird. That exam no, is that plus C. The last question. Last question to follow the same format. So please pause it if um, you want to solve this one on your own. I feel like after two examples, you should be where fifty is zero zero one one zero zero. Thirty eight sixteen twenty four and twenty eight twenty nine thirty. Okay, so fifty dot fifty dot fifty dot zero 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 one zero 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 two zero 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 one zero one one. And this is eight. So this is eight two. Eight to thirteen. Eight to eleven. So so eight to eleven. So eight nine ten. Nine is a valid address, so we can't add it. Nine is valid here, so elimination. Nine is valid here, elimination. Eight, eight, eleven, twelve. D. This is a D right now. Okay, cool. So we've been able to solve for these. Okay. Ah, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Giving um, the address this answer, how many subnets can be obtained from the address block? Now, to obtain the number of subnets, uh, very easy. F50 is.
Oh, we already know what we're going to So, 8, 16, 24, 26. So, this is your network portion. Great. And we already talked about how to find the number of like posts that you can get. You understand? Just realized I didn't talk about something, so let, let's talk. Let's talk about it. Um, possible subnets. Literally, just as I was about to talk about it, now then it hits me. Let let's let's talk about it. My voice is coming. Right. So what happens is that the number of possible subnets, right, that you can have, number of possible subnets equals two raised to the power n. What is n? n is equal to the number of borrowed bits. So right now, so borrowed, borrowed bits is sort of the number of bits that deviate from your from like your classes. So our class, we can only have four um more like standards slash a slash sixteen slash twenty four. So how many have we borrowed from like our class? That is two. We borrowed two because our thing is slash twenty six. So 2 raised to the power 2 is 4. So we can have four possible subnets. It's very, very light. So here, our answer is 4. And for each subnet in the address block, how many valid posts can be obtained? This is another one I didn't talk about. So this one too, we'll talk about number of um, post bits remaining. So how many how many were borrowed and how many were remaining? So um, number of post bits. So you see, um, this one we look at it from the possible of we look at it from the um, realm of um, deviation from our classes. As even though it's class, we look at it from the, the realm of how many bits have we taken from what will usually be like what is usually standard. And so we took two. So how many is left? Six bits are left. So let's use let's take this six as m. So number of road is m, number of road is n, number of remaining remaining bits is m. You understand? Now number of possible hosts, no subnets, so number of possible hosts is equal to two raised to the power m. So two raised to the power six. Sixty four. Yeah, so sixty four. So number of possible posts to sixty four. Great. Now keep in mind that you're not going to find sixty four in answers. You let let's check. Are we going to find six? Yeah, sixty four doesn't exist. Right. And the reason why sixty four we are not going to use sixty four is that you have to take out two four. Um, your broadcast address and then your um, your network address so you get 62 usable hosts and that gives you 62 here so it does is b great and on which subnet can the address be found yes yes, yes. we come back to this and this this one you know right um we talked about it when you say that on which subnet can the address be found they're just basically looking for your network address and we talked about how to find a network address network address is your first address and so it gives you 50 dot 50 dot 50 dot now zero zero one two one two three four you're not gonna use the first one because you, you can't change this one and then your broadcast address is the last one if they ask you that which one is your broadcast address you already know that it is your network part and then you just fill all with zeros and then your network address is your network part and then 
the post address field is zeros. So this one you can obviously see that it's a zero, and this one I don't know what its binary will be. So it obviously has to be a. You understand a. So I hope this makes sense. Okay, so we'll be talking about um, virtual circuits and datagram networks. Is there any other question? Yeah, so with these ones, these ones will have, will, there's some calculation that we'll have to do with number 20, there's some calculation that we'll have to do. And we'll get to it soon. We'll get to it soon. When we talk about it then, um, the, the datagram networks, and then we can get to it. Great. stamps to make sense. Okay, so um let's get to it. Let's get to it. Yes, virtual circuits and data gram networks. Now this is an interesting concept because we talked about IP being um talked about IP being like no guarantees. If you remember in TCP, we talked about two types of TCP. We talked about two types of um, connections, right? Connectionless and connection oriented. Where TCP was connection oriented and then UDP was connectionless. Great. Now, when it comes to network layer, there's something similar. There's something similar. Um, there's a datagram network, and there's a VC network or a virtual circuit network. And the datagram network is what we usually work with, right? Normal datagrams that are flowing through a system, and depending on the bandwidth of the system, your packet flows through or it doesn't. Basically, like that. But a VC network is a network that is much like a virtual circuit. When we talk about packet switching. We said that um, many computers are connected to a router be somewhere, and then when the computers need to use, they just send the information onto the router and then just move. You understand? But what 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 um, um second this packet switching circuit yeah. switching is is that they're all connected here, but whenever Host one wants to make something up. What happens is that it sort of it, it it bridges, yes, it bridges host one and then the connection. So that no other host can use it. You understand? Only one host can use it at a time. That's what VC network we try to do. That's what they're trying to imitate. So what they're trying to do is to set up a flow, trying to set up a flow from source to destination and um allowing the the host or the, the sender to send the information to the um, to the um, destination to a specified path. Right? So let, let's let's assume there are three routers here. Let's make it four. This diagram we'll come back to it when we talk about other things. Yeah. Let's say that you're trying to move from A to B. You can pick this path, move here, move here. Move here, move here, and then get to the end. Right? Or you can pick here and then get here, go here, and move to this end. You understand? You can pick two different directions. But what virtual circuit is, is that virtual circuit assigns links. So this is a link, it assigns it a number. And then specifies that if, if you see you see any packets moving from A to B, let's say pass through one, two, three, five, seven, eight. It specifies a link, and that's what a virtual circuit does. But more than that, virtual circuits, that's what is called um, a call. So in, in establishing virtual circuits, there are three steps, right? You have a call setup. Basically, it sends a packet to the receiver to initiate the call. Right? The, the, the receiver says that, oh, receiver sees a call coming in right? and accepts the call. So then there's data transfer, right? Data transfer from source to destination, right? And then there's all here down. The, 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 the link is thrown down, you understand? So these are the three 
various steps of any um, virtual circuit. And when we talk about it, the virtual circuit numbers I was talking about, it's called a virtual circuit ID, so virtual circuit identifier. So virtual circuits use these virtual circuit IDs. They don't use destination and um, host addresses, only the um, VC IDs, right? Meaning that every single router that is, um, like that's in the thing, you know, every single router that is in the virtual circuit maintains a state of it. So it knows that, oh, when you get to me, like when I'm passing through this link to link 13, right? It knows what to do. So every single router maintains a state of the uh, circuit, right? It knows what is always going on. And then this, because of this, we don't, we don't usually use it, right? There are, there are protocols for working around that MLPS, right? Um, multiple level and um, multiple label packet switching you understand so it maintains a, um, a state of the circuit you understand so it's not really used except by organizations who want to um like they want their systems which are in different locations to have to work on the same network it's a whole other thing but this this all that you need to know if this all that you need to know that vcs keep state ids in their routers and then um the packets are forwarded and the packets are forwarded based on VC IDs. But in datagram networks, packets are forwarded based on destination address, and then no state information is kept. That's the difference between datagram networks and VC networks. The only thing that the only question I've seen so far is that question that talks about number 40 of the MITSM 18 that talks about um which of the following is not um which of the following is not in the like which of the following is not part of the I've forgotten exactly what the question was. Let me see if I can try to find it. Right. Yeah. So it says that um, 39, which of the following is not an identifiable piece in virtual circuit network? Tear down, connect, set up, data transfer, none of the above. So tear down is set up is data transfer is and connect is what is not. You understand? So connect is the answer for that one. Question 39. Yeah. So, that, so we talked about virtual circuits and data gram networks. It's not really that complex. You understand? Not really that complex. Right? Okay. So what, what was the next that we we're going to talk about? NET and IP. NET and IPv6. So let's talk about it. NAT stands for network address translation. So what does this mean? For well, this one, this diagram, it really, it really helps to understand. We're assuming these are laptops, not Game Boys, right? This is the switch. This is the router. What are we trying to do? Um, yeah, so this is what we want. Okay, so this 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 is this is how it's looking. Remember when um I ran the IP config um, command no. You saw that my IP address was um one no it was ten point something right if you remember when, when I under command just IP address so it's because of NAT that we have things like it's IP addresses right right now my address is this right if address. Nobody can find me. You can't do SSH this thing into my laptop. No, it's it don't work. This is um a private address, right? Only the people my network can find me by this address. Nobody on the internet can find me by this address. You understand? So what the router does is that the router establishes um a private network. And right? so everybody here is in a private network. Right? And this private network has its own IP addresses. And this the, the um this private network's 
um, IP address is 10.0.0.0 slash 24, meaning that you can have a lot of hosts here and the host can communicate to themselves like um, it's like so how how you, an analogy that you can use to work around this is house name sort of right so we have a house here and everybody in the house calls you um, um kweku <laughs> calls you kweku right but when you come outside into the world then nobody knows you as kweku everybody knows you as what um um john smith or something you understand you th th that's that's an analogy that you can use to work with it right in the house Everybody calls you, but everybody knows you as Kweku. Like, I can talk to you with Kweku and then you respond and everything. Everything is fine. But when you move outside the world, right? Nobody, if you, if somebody calls you Kweku, so you slap the person. Right? Because that's not your name. That is like known. It's, it's a house name. Those names are, you understand? That, that's how it is, right? So you have a private address. You have a private um, network here. And then everybody inside the network knows you by a certain IP address, right? But when we come into the world, right? Nobody knows you by that IP address. You understand that so inside the router everybody knows you as 10.0.02 but outside in the world nobody knows and how the router does is that the routers here that the routers like link to the network is 10.0.01 and then the rest of the internet knows the router as 138 point this is just an example a random example as it knows the router as this so this is a public address like everybody on the internet can find it like can find it I mean that like i can literally SSH into this address right now if I had credentials, I could, right? Everybody on the internet can find you by this address. This address is well known and everything, you understand. But inside this address, so an example is that um, there's a data center somewhere and everybody knows the data center by this address. And inside the data center, there are computers and there's a private way of working with them. So how does the, the computer, so if, if I want to communicate with somebody inside the network, I can just talk to 10.0.03 and everything will be fine. Now, if 10.0, Point zero two also wants to talk to a certain computer somewhere in the world that has an address of let's say one forty point thirty nine point sixty two point six. Right? How would they talk to him? You understand? Because outside this network, the, the IP address the network is using is this, and you can't just talk to him. So what happens? That the network that's what is called network address translation. You know, it takes this address and then it establishes a table, right? Um, a one side address like this is a wide area address. And the local area network side address. This, this is the local area side. This, this is the local area side. And this is the wide area side. You understand? This is what is happening. Right? Now, what happens is that it uses port numbers right, to identify. So, for example, let's say that you want to talk to um, 140.39.62.6. Um, and then this here is a web server. So, you want to send a message to it. Like five port eighty, so port eighty. Great, it's sending the message to it on port eighty. What happens is that the network, the LAN side will record the person's incoming address, and then we'll assign it a certain port number because you know port numbers. Port numbers can move up to sixty-five k. You understand? Like, like you can have port numbers up to sixty-five thousand. So if if one computer sends a request, it will just log. Um, it's on the LAN side, and then like you know that this is LAN, and then we'll use its own IP address. So the IP addresses for all these computers, the world sees all these computers are just one computer, and then the router differentiates it by the port number. So it will assign the port number is 5001 to it. Now, when the request comes back, it will just take it, just look at the address and look at the port numbers, do a table lookup, and then just change it. It will just change the packet to get the side. I, I hope you understand it. So what, what happens like that that's, that's what is happening basically one the host will send um, a, a packet with its ip address with its private ip address and its port number the router will see this that's number two the router will see this and then log it right it, it will change it and then log it so it will change your ip address to its own ip address and change the um the port number to an arbitrary port number and then place it in a table and to it will send it or the router will respond back to this IP address, like to this IP address, and that nonsense foreign and um, that port number that the router gave it, and then the router will do a table lookup, locate the um, locate the actual uh, the, the corresponding IP address, the corresponding private IP address, and that port number, and then just change it, and then we'll just send it into the network. You understand? And everything is um, beautiful. You get. We talked about what types of uh, 
like addresses that you can use. Talk about 10.0.0.0 slash 8. Talk about 172.168, um, I think, um, slash 12. And then we talk about 192.168 slash 16. So those are the three that you can, you can get. You understand. So that, that's, that's what happens with it. Now, um, um, one problem with this that we have is what is called the end to end argument. We'll talk about it some more um, later when we talk about the control plane. But um, it's, it's, it's like this, right? The network should be as dumb as possible. The network should just provide. You see how when I talked about the IP, I said that oh, the IP is a blank slate. That's how your network should be. The network should be as blank as possible. There should be nothing that um, the network does. The network should just provide a system of communication. If you want something, implement it as an, uh, what do you call it? as a protocol in the application. That, that, that's, that's what you want. You don't want the network to be changing headers and then logging. Things. You, just, you, just, you, don't want, you don't want that. You don't want that. So, the network address translation violates this argument, and that's the problem that most people have with NAT. And um, also, any NAT was so um, NAT and then IPv6 were created to solve the problem of IPv4 um, finishing. You understand? I don't think I've explained this, but basically, IPv4 has 4.29 billion addresses, and as I mentioned, every thing like every interface has an IP address. Every interface that is like connected has an IP address, meaning that you can have a router that has about three or four IP addresses for each of its interfaces. You have Apple Watches right now that can connect to the internet. You have phones, you have smart speakers, smart fridges, smart plugs. Everything is becoming smart. And as soon as IP address is literally getting finished, like it's it, it is getting finished. You understand? In 2011, um, the ICANN, the national um, something of assign names and numbers. Well, I think go we'll just go back a little. You remember right? of assigned names and numbers are located. If you remember, I said that ICANN is at the top. Um, regional registries are here and local registries are here. They assign the last of its speeds to the regional registries. That means that doesn't mean the IP addresses are finished, but it just means that ICANN has no more IP addresses to give. Now the regional registries have IP addresses that they can give, but at the very top level, there are no more IP addresses to give. So what happens is that. Um, the NAT was created so that a network won't, a network is just using, like let's say there are 12,000 computers in a network, they are all using one single IP address, you understand? So the IP addresses are conserved. And IPv6 also was also created to solve this problem of IPv4 addresses getting finished. And now um, IPv6 has 128 bit address, you understand? That is a lot, like I think it's 16 um, number of addresses. That means like, Honestly, feasibly can't get finished. Like they honestly can't get finished because the number. I think it's it's it's. I, I was I was just talking to you about the, the, the number of columns of voter or something that is related to it. I think it's larger than the number of um, atoms you have in ICO. Some weird fact to be like that. Yes. So we come to IPv6, right? So yes. So basically, the reason why IPv6 was needed was that 32 bit address was finished. 32 bit IP address was getting finished. So you needed a longer address. And the second one is that there's so many fields in IPv4. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, the fields are just too much. So in a bit to reduce it, you know, one that's one of the innovations IPv6 came up with. So let's look at the IPv6 datagram format. It's not as bulky as the other one, so just bear with me. Right. Here we have a version field, same version 6 or 4. Right? And we have um, a type code. This, this, this is a priority field. Right. It identifies priority among data flows. If you remember, we talked about um, what do you call it? Oh, um, ah, the diff set. Yes, there's a lot of information that's in the diff set, um, which provides um, um, priority to different classes of um, traffic. You understand? That's the same thing that the priority is doing here, but it doesn't have an ECM. And this is a flow label. So, so one thing that um, we've been talking about is that we see pack, we see data as packets right packet a packet b packet c but that's not how ipv6 wants you to think like wants um, you to think about the data it wants for you to think about the data in sort of a flu it's sort of like water so even though the molecules are separate it's just one large um, um, blob of water that is just moving so this is a flu label like it's not really important but i just wanted to explain it. this is the length of your payload total length of it this is 
your next header. So the next header is interesting because it's the same thing as your upper layer field. It talks about whether it's TCP or UDP, basically. This is the hop limit, and it's basically doing the same work as your time to template field. And this is the source address. You see, we are done. There's no fragmentation. We are sending flags, plenty things that we have. No, this is it. Right? We have a source IP address, which keep in mind is 128 bits. And then we have a destination IP address, which is also 128 bits. Yeah, and then we have the payload data. But the payload data, it can be up, it can be variable. So that's why we need to keep a length here so that we can know exactly where the payload starts from and where it ends. Okay, good. So what 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 are the kind of things that are missing? There's no checksum here. There's no fragmentation. And we are simply bits. There's no options field. There are plenty of things that are missing. So that's, that's the difference between the two. Yes. So one important concept that was mentioned, and we'll, we'll run through it really quickly here, is tunneling, because the video is becoming kind of long. Yeah. And then we'll move on to other things. OK, tunneling. What is tunneling? Yes. Now, the, 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 the question that tunneling is trying to solve is that, um, how are these two standards working with each other? How does the um, IPv4 and IPv6 work with each other? And the thing is that there's no like, you see, the day the, in 2007, I think, um, there was a day that we all switched to the new currency. It's not like that with this IPv6. It's not like that. It's not a day that, like, actually, if you bring a thousand CDs, I won't accept. You understand? That, that's just how it works. Right? Um, but these two standards are just working, like, right now, they're servers that. There are systems that are using IPv4 and IPv6. If you remember, you saw this, right? Link local IPv6 address. You understand? So this, this is an uh, um, IPv6 address. Yeah. It's, that means it's working with an IPv4 address at the same time. You are. Yeah. So it's not, it's not like that. Yeah. All here. So let's talk about it. Tunnel is basically the process of allowing an IPv4 datagram. To hold an IPv6 datagram. So this is an IPv4 data. <laughs> okay, beautiful. This is an IPv4 datagram and this is an IPv6 datagram. This is basically the header. Right. Yes, so this is what is just basically going on. So what happens is that you have a system like this. As I said, very simply, I'm not going to talk about anything. So this is A, B, C, C, D, E, F. Right. We want to move from A to F, right? So I want to send some data from A to F. But A to F are IPv6 routers. They are IPv6 compliant. So how will we send it? So what happens is that for you to send the data between two IPv6 routers that are not connected together, and right? you need routers that are both IPv6 and IPv4 compliant. And these, these ones are just IPv4 routers. This, this is like the normal internet, you know. So this, this is a network. What happens is that you make an IPv6 packet, like the same thing, you no, know, but you see the, the datagram format, just look at that. You, know. you make it like that. That's an IPv6 datagram. And when it gets to an IPv6 slash IPv4 datagram, it looks at the next one. Are you IPv6 or are you IPv4? Then because it's IPv4, what it does is that it takes this packet and then pushes it here and then places it in an IPv4 datagram. What we just saw a little earlier in the video. You understand? So this is IPv6 datagram and just encapsulated inside an IPv4 datagram. And then because IPv4, it can send it. But one important thing is that here, yeah, the destination is um, F. Here, yeah, the destination is F, right? Like when you look at this IPv4 data, the destination is F. But here, it will change the destination to be the next IPv4, like the closest IPv4 router to F, which is E. So here, the destination becomes E, right? And the source becomes E. But there's an IPv6 datagram here inside. So 
you send it to the IPv4, and then IPv4 handles it like normal, just handles it. Now, when it gets to here, when it gets to the IPv6, it looks at it and says, ah, yeah, an IPv6 format, and then it looks at the destination here, and then sends it to this destination as an IPv6 datagram. This, this, is it. Like, this is what happens. And this thing from B to E is called an IPv4 tunnel. And this is tunneling. It's right? encapsulating an IP, um, IPv6 datagram into an IPv4 um, datagram, sending it through an IPv4 network. So it gets to here and then it's decapsulated and then sent as usual. And so this is how IPv4 and IPv6, they work with each other at the moment, you understand? Okay, that's beautiful. Okay, so generalized forwarding is next. Generalized forwarding. Generalized forwarding. So we talked about destination-based forwarding and then generalized forwarding when we we're talking about functions of um, routers. So what is generalized forwarding? Generalized, so in destination-based forwarding, what happens is that we forward based on the destination. And so we use the name. In generalized forwarding, we generalize this behavior by forwarding by, first of all, we match on various things. We don't, we don't just match on the destination um, IP address. We match on various things. We see what these things are, but we can match on various fields plus action. We can take more action than just forwarding. So match and plus action. So we call it the match plus action. Beautiful. And that's what generalized forwarding is basically about. So let's talk about the matching. Right. Now, um, <clears throat> what destination-based forwarding does is that it's, it can match, meaning that it can compare the um, destination IP address with um, a forwarding table and then determine where to forward it. But with this, we can match based on any of the fields in any of the layers, or maybe except the application layer, right? So first of all, the transport layer, transport layer, right? We can match on TCP or UDP destination port number, right? Meaning that we can do something based on destination um, and port number. We can do something based on the source port number. You understand so um i don't know whether you've ever um tried to oh what exactly that book can i even give sir oh well make it make sense um yes this is a beautiful when we first came to um ken USD, eh, right if you ever connected to ken USD with your phone and then you try to access snapper well that, it, it doesn't work if you try to go on to um, first year those movie sites that we had right if you try to use it it, it, it doesn't work you understand because you are trying to access something and then the router itself like king west's router is blocking you it's not the router it's not the destination that is blocking you it's the source that is blocking you so the port number is being blocked and that's that's an example of um generalized forwarding you can block a service right so it, it was blocking that website um that website's port number and if you try it so um i think telegram wasn't even working i don't know what they did but so they're blocking those port numbers Right. When you come to the network layer, right, you can do something based on five fields, right? The IP source address, the IP destination address, the IP protocol, the IP type of service field. So, for example, let's say that you want your laptop wants to block some uh, some some um, some address coming from somewhere you know of a particular person and you don't want to receive any packet from the person you can block that particular ip address right or you can forward that ip address you see i'm just talking about blocking but the action can do much more than just block you understand now we come to the link layer or the data link layer we can have several that we can talk about we can talk about the source mac address we'll talk about mac addresses when we get to the address resolution protocol, 
source MAC address, we can talk about the destination MAC address. We can talk about the Ethernet style. There are several types of Ethernet. Ethernet 1.0, and then I've got another one. I don't think it's 2.0. <laughs> um, Ethernet type. Let's so talk about the virtual LAN ID. And then we can also talk about the virtual LAN pri. And then for the physical layer, we can just talk, basically talk about the ingress port. Um, ingress port is basically like what port you come in with. Um, how you can configure this is that um, maybe, for example, you're a parent and then you don't want your children just to be online um, from the hours of 10 to, let's say, 6 a.m. You understand? So you can set up your router to block um, like to block all traffic right? that is coming from the laptop that's in your child's room. So you are blocking an entire port. You understand? Or you can forward the entire port somewhere or you can just copy it. It's, we'll be talking about action. But these are the fields that you can match on. Right? Several fields. I think there are 13 in total. Great. So what kind of actions can you take? As you've matched, right? First of all, I've been talking about a plane. You can drop the packet. Meaning that like you can extinguish the packet. The packets are bit, so you can just extinguish them. They don't go anywhere. Right? You can forward the packets. This is what like everybody expects. You can modify the fields in the packet. Um, a few minutes ago, I was talking about NAT. Right? NAT modifies the fields in the packet. So um, you can do that. Right? You can encapsulate the packet. And then send it to a controller for some action to be taken. Right. And then finally, you can copy the packets. You can log the packet or you can finally record the packets. Right. This is very important when um, like you're looking at error messages, working with service and such. Great. Good. So let's look at something. Now we see we've talked about generalized forwarding here, but generalized forwarding is not, it's, a, it's just a concept. You understand? It's like the concept of gene editing. It's just the concept that is there. It's just nothing. But when CRISPR came out, CRISPR gave us um, a standard for um, talking about gene editing. You understand? So when it comes to generalized forwarding, there's one standard that has been really popularized the Open Flow 1.0 standard. So this provides sort of um, a standard, standard meaning that it provides some checks, some balances, it provides some requirements that you can implement generalized forwarding very effectively in, you understand? So let's look at it. Now, this is basically how it looks like, but we, look, we talked about how to match it, right? So how, how do you implement some things? Um, let's look at it. This is the ingress port. This is the MAC source address. This is the MAC destination. This is the Ethernet type. This is the VLAN ID. This is the VLAN pri. This is the IP source address. This is the IP destination address. This is the IP protocol. This is the IP type of service field. This is the TCP slash UDP source port. And this is the TCP slash UDP destination port. And then finally, there's some action. So, so you see how, this, this is how it will look like, right? Where an X means don't care. So let's say that we're implementing a firewall. It, um, I think I talked about this, but let, let, me, let me mention it again, right? Um, with with so there are some sensitive services, right? Some sensitive services. An example of the sensitive service is the um, U.S. Department of um, Defense, right? With them, they don't want anybody to be able to access their files from the outside. You understand? But they need to share information. So let's say their laptops inside, right? They need to be able to share information among themselves. But they don't want anybody from the outside to be able to, like, access their service inside. So what they do is that. They block all um, um, 
outgoing, like all incoming packets. Right? So if there's any packet that is trying to get inside the computer, it is blocked, regardless of wherever it is coming from, it is blocked. You understand? And that, that's an example of what you can do with generalized forwarding. We'll talk about it some more. You can implement various things with generalized forwarding. One is a firewall. We've talked about it. Right? A firewall is basically a service that can block other services from having access to um, um, a host. An example is that um, I think everybody has talked about SSH thing. So let's talk about IP addresses, right? So you want to be able to block Google from like, you don't want any laptop to be able to access Google or you don't want any laptop to be able to access Beautiful. Um, 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 KUSD doesn't allow um, betting sites on, like you can't access betting sites from your laptop, I, I think. I think um I don't don't quote me on that, but you shouldn't be able to access betting sites from your laptop. So let's assume that the network doesn't allow you to. So what can you do? What you can do is that you can set up um a destination IP address. Meaning that whenever KNC sees this, let's say you send a packet and the destination is Betway, right? Betway's IP address is 192.60.7.4.7. Let's say this is Betway's IP address. You understand? And um, whenever you send a packet that this is a destination, it tells it tells it to block it. Right? So this is how it will appear. It doesn't care about the ingress port, the source mark, the destination, the Ethernet type, this IP source, IP protocol type of service source port, this one. But basically, just cares about this one. And the action is to block. So this is how it can you can use to implement a firewall. Number two is you can use to implement an um, um, an NAT, right? Network address translation. What you can do is that you can match the IP address, right, and the port number. So when you match the IP address and the port number, like the source, the sorry, the destination port number, then you can do something to it, right? So um, you remember when we talked about NAT a few minutes ago, we talked about NAT looking at the destination, um, looking at the source rather, sorry, the source and then the port number, right? Looking at these two, it will modify it. So you can use generalized forwarding to, um, to implement a network address translation router. Number three is you can implement a switch. You can you understand. You can match a destination MAC address, right? And then you can forward or flood. Basically, you can also implement a router with this um, um, open flow standard. Now, um, this 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 is basically the open flow. It allows you to match on more than the destination forwarding. There was no questions that came for this one, but please be alert. Cool, let's talk about middle boxes. Middle boxes, right? So so this one I'm not right, so please listen to me, right? A middle box is any intermediary box, right, or device performing functions apart from normal standard functions of an IP router. So the question comes, what are the normal standard functions of an IP router? We talked about it. What is the router supposed to do, right? The router is just basically supposed to forward your packets. So if any box, right, does anything apart from forwarding packets, right, it's basically a middle box. You understand? It's basically a middle box. Right now, the middle boxes enable things like um, um, network address translation to be possible, it enables things like firewall to be possible, it enables other things like load balancer, um, load balancers, you know this for the meantime, it, um, enables things like CDNs. At a, a, a. Yeah, okay, I, I was right. CDNs, content domain networks to be yeah, built. Also, um, um, enables things like IDS and then um, um, uh, application layer um, specific functions, right? To, to for it to come. And so when you pair middle boxes with generalized forwarding, then these functions start to become apparent. To understand, generalized forwarding allows you to do anything to a packet, like based on anything. And middle boxes are just flat boxes that can make. So the, the generalized forwarding is a software part of it and then middle boxes are the hardware part of it the hardware that allows you to drop packets because ip routers usually cannot drop packets just like that they don't have the hardware capable of dropping packets they don't have the hardware capable of logging packets and generalized forwarding um, routers also don't have the software that enable them to log packets but both just one is the hardware 
this one is just a blank slate and this one to um generalized coding to is just a blank slate for software i, I hope this makes sense to just hardware and software across the board great great so um it also allows things like nfv right network functions virtualization now th th this is an interesting concept this is an interesting concept because um at first then uh, to implement network functions you need a literal um, um, device to do that you, you can't you can't do a switch and then your switch is software you understand but right now you can virtualize that means that you can write software for most of the networking functions that you have right so if you want a firewall instead of having a literal firewall device thing um, in your router somewhere you no know, right you can just implement it in software and that's what generalized forwarding and the middle boxes are getting us towards right the virtualization of every kind of function that a network can need so whenever you need it just write code for it instead of building hardware and i, I think that's 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 making it a little easier as time is going along and breaking down the barrier for um, writing applications for networks okay okay great i'm talking about the end-to-end -end argument right that some functionality sh like intelligence shouldn't be in the network right in intelligence should be in the devices we've also talked about um, how those are that is violated when you come to things like nat and then middle boxes too okay beautiful so um take a breather there if you've not like get into the control plane The control plane is really simple because we didn't really talk a lot about it. We talked about a few things. Okay, so we know what con the control plane is, right? The control plane is basically um, what does routing in your system. You understand? So various devices can do routing, but like let's say various devices, um, various devices can forward packets out of um, they can forward packets out of links, but to determine the general route that you are going. Because it's like this thing. I, I, I saw I saw someone um, start today, and then um, I've forgotten what exactly it was, but basically, I think it was girlfriend. I think he was talking about some um, daily uh, um, activities is what will lead you, right? The daily activity in itself is nothing, right? In itself, it's like forwarding. But what the daily activity builds stores, it builds stores the habits. And the habit is like sort of like um, um, your routing, like the big overview of it. You understand and um, great so um routing algorithms like here we'll just talk about routing algorithms routing algos there are also no questions here so what are routing algos routing algorithms are basically mathematical functions right that that help you find the least cost path from source to destination that's what basically you're doing right and the two types of routing algorithms one is called the link state algorithm and one is called the distance vector algorithm and both of them are interesting in how they handle it to understand so you see there's not a lot of things to talk about in this one because he skipped so much of it it's so, so so much of it so um link state algorithm is in link state eh? you see it's in the name state of the link right to links let's see this the state of a link is the cost of traversing from e to b right so let's say this like to send the packets from here to here um, the cost is 12 and cost can mean anything cost can be the bandwidth cost like you see when when you mention cost to me right cost can mean the energy in doing something cost can mean the amount of money in doing something cost can mean the difficulty in getting that thing done when there's some things like the cost is no money the cost is like just just in doing it you understand what what example is there that i can even um, give well some like Rich people, their their cost is 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 no in actual cash. Maybe it's in humiliation or something. I mean, like it's becoming weird, but yeah, that's what I mean. Cost can be dependent on so so much. You understand? So this cost it can be bandwidth cost. Depend the network operator is um, who will determine like what what this cost is and how to define. Usually the cost is a combination of some factors, right? Used for um um. Rich, um Oh, this is, I forgot to, it, it, like it, this proportionality. You use proportionality to do it. Right? So you use proportionality. So let's say your cost is proportional to um, um your bandwidth. You understand? Your cost is inversely proportional to the electricity used. 
the cost is proportional to um, what else like <laughs> the length of your your link right depending on however you look at it your cost can be a lot of things great so the link needs talks about knowing the full topology of your network so if your network is made up of 12 devices right you need to know the full topology of your network before you can do any calculation and that's what the link state algorithm does right and the distance vector algorithm basically says that oh me and i just need the the um the costs of the routers close to me and then i'll do the calculation so a knows one two three four the cost of all these links then when it does the calculation it will it will send them to b c d e right that, that's what the distance vector does the distance vector just calculates the cost of all the links that are connected to it and then propagates them to the connected routers and the connected routers too will send him like it's connected ones so that over time it's sort of like propagating so over time everybody knows what is happening in the network i don't have to have full topology of the network but i still know the cost of everybody in the network i don't have to do calculations myself to understand and that's what the distance vector is link state you need to know the state of every link in the network the entire network from the distance vector you just need to know the the um, the cost of the um, the routers that are connected to you directly you understand great like with this with this thing i just said we just covered a lot of information like we've just covered a lot you understand okay yeah so let's talk about it ospf right this stands for open shortest path test great great great, great. now one question that The video is becoming long again. Okay. Okay. So I feel like here's a good place to end. Here's a good place to end. So that we can get some things to talk about the next time. So we, we are left with um the OSPF, LFA BG and MP, right? Open short test five, border gateway um, protocol. And then we finally talk about um, the link state, the link layer, right? For the data link layer, and then we are finally done with the networking. So please. Hold on for me. If you have any questions, please let us know by uh, putting it in the group, right? Um, I'll push as much as possible to accept all for the, um, the questions that everybody sent so that we can just solve them online and everybody can move. I also have some questions that um, I think that it will be very useful that if we solved. If you didn't understand anything, please, you can text me and then um, like we'll find a solution to it on the next stream that we have, the last one. Thank you so much for tuning in and God bless you. This exam you blow crap.